Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I'll, uh, I'm not going to attempt to do it in Estonian. I would not do a very good job. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks to Iagronom, firstly, for having me here. Um, it's a real pleasure to come and talk to you. Um, this isn't actually my first time in Estonia. I was here back in, in January for the, for the Northern Roots Conference, although I was kept in the dark for two days, basically, either in a hotel room, a restaurant, or uh, a venue. So it was actually quite nice to see some of the Estonian countryside this time, as Simon has been you know, driving me around the last couple of days. Um, so yeah, observations from that. It's very flat in Estonia, <laughs> much like my home county in England of Norfolk. You can see a long way. Um, there's lots of trees. Uh, and I'm also very jealous in many ways. Uh, I'm jealous of your all-seed rape, which looks fantastic, because we really struggle to grow it uh, in England now. And I'm also very jealous of the fact that you appear to have nearly finished drilling wheat, whereas in England we haven't even started, barely, having just had somewhere around about a third of our annual rainfall in two weeks. Um, so it's going to be yet another very challenging farming year. So um, I'm going to do a bit of audience participation as well. I know Simon already asked this question, but just so as we can, we can start the ball rolling again, can you just put your hands up if you are a farmer? So I can see. Okay. Yeah, it's about 50%. You weren't, you weren't, we weren't far off. Who's an agronomist? Okay, good number of agronomists. Um, was that a boo? Boo. Okay, yeah, no. Uh, who's in the seed industry? Cover crop seeds. Okay, only a couple. That's weird, considering it's a cover crop field day. Anyway, they must all be outside drinking tea. Um, Okay, so then the rest must just be here for a free lunch, yeah? Okay, yeah, good. Always important. Um, okay, yeah, so who am I? Uh, so for the last nearly 10 years, uh, I've been working for a company called Hutchinson's in the UK. Um, they're an agronomy and input provider. So I've been an agronomist for them for, for that amount of time. Then in the last four to five years, I set up their agroecology service, which is basically running everything to do with regenerative agriculture for that, for that company. But just before Christmas, I will be leaving Hutchinson's and joining a company called Wild Farmed, who are millers, so they have 100 growers in the UK growing wheat for them to regenerative standards, which then they sell on to a range of customers. At this point, I'll ask who's seen Clarkson's farm on Amazon? Yeah, a good amount, yeah. So the big, tall, scruffy-haired guy in a white T-shirt who planted a field of wheat and beans together, which everybody thought was crazy, that's Wild Farm. That's who I'm going to go and work for. Um, so, yeah, equally as crazy. So, yeah, I've, I've put up... These are my learnings from seven years of Regen Ag. Now, seven years doesn't sound like a long time in farming, um, but if you multiply seven years up across somewhere around 30 farms... You know, that's 210 opportunities I've had to mess up and also have some successes. So, you know, there's a, there's a large weight of, of learning, both, both negative and positive, that, uh, you know, I'm able to hopefully share some of today. I can't do all of that in roughly 20 minutes, but I'm going to cover off some of my kind of latest thoughts uh, around Region Ag. So, regenerative agriculture or as I'm sort of increasingly beginning to call it, um, resilient agriculture, because a lot of the challenges that we're now facing, be that through climate and weather patterns, extreme weather, or markets, or prices, actually the core of this job now is just about how can we farm? Not how would we like to farm, how can we farm in the best possible way, how can we just farm effectively? But luckily for me, many of the, the answers to the challenges that we have in farming, I believe, and many believe, lie in regenerative principles. Okay, so making a farm more resilient often involves implementing regenerative principles. So this, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of intimately familiar with your challenges in Estonia. I've managed to pick up some of the challenges over the last couple of days, talking to Simon and others. So I know that you deal with extremes of weather, certainly in comparison to England. But, but what we've seen in the UK is these extremes are becoming more often. So we have droughts more often, we have extreme weather events more often, uh, we have flooding, we have just suddenly masses of snow, 
sometimes minus temperatures. We had minus 15, which for us is very cold, uh, two years ago. <clears throat> and then last winter, we, we had two days of frost. So the weather is all over the place. And that is our single biggest challenge, and that's the thing that we're, we're trying to tackle as best we can. And this is how we're trying to do it. So has any, have any of you been to Groundswell, the show in, in, the, in England? Yeah, one, two, oh, there's a few, nice. Well, if you, uh, if you ever fancy a trip across in June, you should definitely come and visit Groundswell. There's a lot to be learned there. Um, so they put together this nice uh, image, which actually goes on a tea towel, which you can buy. I don't know whether people know what tea towel means, but anyway, yeah, you wash your, dry your dishes with it. Um, so you can have a constant reminder every time you're drying your dishes of how you should be farming. Um, so it works, regenerative agriculture, obviously, I'm sure you know, works on these, these key principles. And we're relying on these more and more to build uh, healthy soils, resilient soils, and a resilient farming system. So... For me, and I think it doesn't matter whether you're thinking of starting to change your farming system or whether you've already started or whether you're already a long way down the road, having an understanding <clears throat> excuse me, of, of, of where you are is absolutely critical. Simon mentioned understanding where you are from a carbon perspective. I'm talking about understanding where you are as your whole farm system. So I carry out baseline assessments with all of the farms that I work with. I also manage four farms, and those farms, when I first took them on at various stages over the last uh, 10 years, we always started with a baseline. So where are we, what can we do now, and, and how does that inform what we do in the future? Um, so yeah, I've said, and, and particularly with regenerative agriculture, trying to implement Regen Ag without having baselines is like putting a destination in a sat-nav that doesn't know where it is. So you, you have to know where you're starting to be able to navigate your way to an end point. Uh, there we go. Yeah, so the kinds of baselines, I split them up into, into four key areas. I've gone ahead of myself there. Okay, we're going to put them all up. Nice. Um, <laughs> so soil is a key one. It, it, it's, the, it's the biggest resource we have on any farm. It's the most important resource to manage because everything you do, everything you produce, relies on that soil. It's your biggest asset as a farmer. It's your, it's your biggest asset financially, but it's also the thing that has the most impact on, on what you do and what you produce. So understanding your soil in terms of the chemistry, the physics, the biology, and putting all of those three elements together allows you to identify the potential of your land, its, its weaknesses, its strengths, uh, and then how to identify the correct system and the correct management practices uh, to bolt on top. Next, we look at resources as a whole. So obviously that includes soil, but we're looking at the farm habitat. So what is the potential for my farm to support pollinators, natural predators, beneficial insects, birds, etc., which now are increasingly beginning to have a value? Um, what's the climate? You know, what am I up against? to produce crops here? And then what's the infrastructure? So by that I mean buildings, tracks, etc. How does the farm actually look? Staff is a really key one. Uh, speaking from experience, in England we have a real, well in the UK as a whole, we have a real problem with good people in farming now. Uh, highly skilled, keen, hardworking young people coming into agriculture uh, is a real struggle. So. It's all well and good having a, a grand, ambitious plan of how you want to farm, but if you haven't got the people around you to be able to implement that plan, you're, you're going to struggle. And then what machinery do you have, and what are the market opportunities? Where can you sell your produce? Can you look at new markets? And then what's your current output? So simple stuff, tonnes per hectare, kilos per day if you're in livestock, litres per day in dairy. Uh, how, many t how many kilos of nitrogen does it take me to produce a tonne of ton of wheat, so therefore how efficient am I, how productive am I? And then importantly, looking at the finances. So how much money am I making? Um, not just turnover, but margin. Um, how, how much labour do I use per hectare or per tonne of what I produce? How much horsepower am I using per tonne? What's my cash flow? How much ability do I have to invest capital in this business? Because if you're going to implement change, quite often that means... Uh, you know, deploying capital to be able to do so. But these things are also excellent K KPIs as you go along. So as you implement new practices, using some of these measures is a really good way of checking how you're doing. 
So they're the baseline assessments. And once you know all of that stuff, you're in a very good position then to be able to implement whatever it is that you want to do and have a high degree of success when you do it. Another thing that I do is always set objectives. Now, it seem, when you go through this process, it seems a bit sort of tedious when you do it, but actually it's really important because without objectives, you know, we, you and your staff and the people that are involved in your farm, your family, have no idea what it is you're trying to achieve. And if they don't know what you're trying to achieve, they can't support you in doing that. So I like to split these up and have like an overall mission statement. And this is just an example. I want to grow food crops profitably while improving biodiversity. That might be your, your mission statement as a farm. But then it's also putting up um, some short, medium and long-term objectives. So what do I want to achieve uh, this year? Maybe I want to start using SAP analysis. What do I want to ch achieve in the next three years? Uh, maybe I want to reduce my nitrogen by 20% whilst, whilst maintaining yield. And then long term, maybe I want to eliminate fungicides. Sorry for the people who sell fungicides here. But that's just an example, okay? Um, and then use those KPIs as I've talked about, but try and make them simple. So don't overcomplicate how you're measuring your success. Keep it nice and simple, things that you're easily able to measure. You'll have to just shout if I'm running out of time. Um, yeah, and it's never too late to start this process. If you're already on the, on the journey, then, then still do it. It's still of good use. So when it comes to implementing all this stuff, okay, how do we implement uh, these principles now that we know in the best way that we want to do it? So I would say small steps are really important. If you suddenly try and revolutionize your farming system overnight, be it uh, I'm going to go from tilling my entire farm to going no-till tomorrow, it's going to fail, and it's going to fail spectacularly. I've seen it happen many a time. So small changes over a period of time is the best way to make a success of it. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay here. Um, yeah, implement all of the principles, not just one. So a lot of farms I've, I've been called to over the years are going, this region hack, it doesn't work. I'm going out of business. Show me how to make it work. And you actually drill down into the detail and they've just picked up one thing. So I kept the same farming system, but I implemented cover crops. Or I kept the f same farming system, but I just bought a new drill. You have to implement all of the principles together to make this system work. There's no good focusing in on one of them individually because it will, again, go wrong spectacularly. Soil, biology, physics, and chemistry are all equally important and interlinked. So historically, we've looked at very basic one-dimensional chemistry when we've analyzed soils. We've maybe looked at physics a little bit, but normally it's kind of big tractors with steel versus soil, and it's been this battle of human versus soil over the years. We're now beginning to realize that that has a role. And then more latterly, we're looking at soil biology, which is really important. We don't know much about it, um, but it's very important. But all of those things are interlinked. Marginal gains. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the British cycling team from the 2012 Olympics, but the guy who was in charge of them developed this concept of marginal gains. In a nutshell, f try and make differences to every single small element of your business, and overall it will make, uh, it will make a positive impact. And I, one thing I always encourage farmers to do is have a trial area. So if you're changing a system, that's great. But always have, be it a, a tram line or, or one field or half a field, where you're continuing to farm in the way that you maybe you used to, and also an area where you want to be. And what that does is it gives you a really good sense check of, of where you are on that progression. So is what I'm trying to do working? Or actually, would I still be making more money if I was doing it the old way? Or actually, when am I ready to implement these changes quicker? Because in that part of the farm, I've already tried it. So it's a really good way of, of, of double checking where you are. In terms of practice, this is essentially what we're, what we're trying to aim for. We, we want your soils looking like the right-hand side of that diagram all of the time. Because if you've got that process happening, you can't go too far wrong. 
And that's the best way that we've found to mitigate against these, these climate pressures. So whether it's too wet, too dry, having that system on the right-hand side is always going to put you in best place. So when it rains too much, the soil will drain effectively, but it will also store lots of water for when you have dry times. Um, that is where we want to be all of the time. And it links into this. So again, that image that was on the right is now on the left. And what this is doing is it's having root systems, soil protection, good soil structure all the time is allowing effective drainage. It's retaining and fixing nutrients for our crops to use. It's stabilizing and structuring soil, protecting it from extreme weather events, be that snow, cold, drought, rain, whatever. But most importantly, the thing that drives all of the systems that we're doing when we're producing whatever it is that we grow on our farms is all reliant on this system here which is called photosynthesis it's been around a long time a lot longer than me a lot longer than all of us um, this system is really effective the best thing we can do on our farms is get out of its way stop messing it up and allow this to happen as much as we possibly can capturing something that's free okay the sun and turning it into uh, CO2, uh, taking in CO2 and sunlight, turning it into sugars, pushing them out through the roots, feeding biology, they feed our plant nutrients. Happy days. That's what we want all of the time. So I've, I've focused in on here on one of the, or the first key principle of Regen Ag, which is minimizing disturbance. And this is a wonderful example of how not to minimize disturbance, okay? So lots of, lots of people in the UK have done this is they see, uh, they get sort of swept up in the excitement of region ag and things, oh brilliant, I can go out and spend 100,000 pounds on a new shiny drill and I can direct drill my crops. And quite often this happens, okay, because they haven't understood what their soils are capable of at that time. They haven't understood how best to get use out of that drill and how best to make it work. And I see this on, on multiple occasions. So wrong drill, wrong soil type, uh, wrong conditions. So, actually underneath, soil structure is not too bad. Uh, but we've got this, in, in this particular example, this is in the Midlands in the UK, it's a heavy clay soil. We used a direct disc drill in the wrong conditions, we didn't have soil cover, that top two to three inches of soil is just not ready for being direct disc drilled and we got really poor establishment as a result. So what we did, I said to this guy, you know, you need to go right back to the basics, you need to do your baselines, you need to understand what it is you're trying to do and what you have, um, and then we can set about it in a much more educated way. So this is the same field eight months later, and what we did when we had all that un baseline understanding, we, ha we had to destroy that previous crop because it was no good. So instead we put in a multi-species summer cover crop, we applied some gypsum, calcium sulfate because there it's that soil is very high magnesium which which imp, um, affects soil structure quite badly so we applied gypsum we then grazed that cover crop because in england we have these white furry things called sheep which i don't think you have here looking at it um, so we gra grazed off that cover crop uh, we did a very shallow surface cultivation um, and then we drilled winter wheat in there and this is the difference in crop establishment same field same drill just a, a different thinking of practices so hopefully that demonstrates that this isn't just a case of picking one or two things and implementing them. It has to be a systems thinking to make it work. And we have a saying uh, in the UK called say, that goes well sown, half grown. So if you establish your crops really well, you're halfway there to producing a good crop. Diversity. I've, I've focused in on this because it's by far and away my favorite of the, the five key principles of Regen Ag. And, and the reason it's my favorite is because quite often it's cool. It's really exciting to do some of these things. Maybe I'm just boring. Um, but I think personally it de delivers the most benefits in the shortest uh, amount of time. So some examples we've got here. If I start in the, the bottom left, we've got uh, a crop of wheat, but it's a blended wheat, so four different varieties. Why do we do that? Well, yes, it's all wheat, but it, let's try and introduce some diversity wherever we can, rather than just growing a complete monocrop of wheat. We're also seeing benefits from disease reduction by growing blended varieties, um, which is helping us on input reduction. Top left, we have all seed rape with an understory of clover, so that clover remains in place for the whole rotation, and then we just drill our crops um, over the top. 
that's working quite well, it has its challenges, um, but it's protecting the soil, it's retaining moisture, it's suppressing weeds, it's sharing nitrogen with the crop. In the middle at the top, uh, this is a herbal lay. So we're beginning to graze our sheep and cattle on much more diverse pastures rather than just grass. Um, I always say it's a little bit like me telling you, you have to eat, um, you have to eat bread three times a day, every day for your entire life. We wouldn't thrive, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be very healthy if we had to do that. A cattle uh, and sheep are exactly the same. They want a mixed diet, a diverse diet, and this is how we do that. So it's benefiting soil and it's bet benefiting the animal through its diet. Top right is what we affectionately in the UK call boats, which is a mixture of beans and oats. Um, we grow them together, we combine them together, and then we separate them post-harvest. And this has been a real success story for us because when you compare growing beans and oats together versus growing the individual crops on their own, we're finding that basically it's an input-free crop. You drill the seed, you walk away, you combine it. And the yields are increased because you've got two elements that you're harvesting rather than just one. Uh, because you've got that mixed crop, the disease just doesn't come into the crop. It, or it does, but it's at low levels and it, it never takes, takes off. It's just such an easy crop to manage. Um, and that all is because of that diversity. And those two crops have a really nice synergism. They grow really well together. And that's the same with peas and barley. So we grow peas and barley for silage uh, for cattle quite a lot. That's been something that's been done for years. It's well known, but it works really well. And the same principle applies. But we're not just getting diversity within the crop. We're also trying to get diversity around the crop. So um, we, since we left the EU, we now have our own system of payments. Um, and in England, we're being paid quite good sums of money to increase uh, biodiversity on our farms. And lots of fields will have flower-rich margins around the outsides of the field. So in this example, we've got a flower margin all the way around the field. And then on the inside, we have our pea and barley whole crop for our beef cattle. Um, I can't explain to you how much that's improving bird numbers, uh, pollinator numbers, insect numbers across the whole farm. Now I understand nobody's necessarily paying us yet for having more birds or more bees, but the, the value is definitely there in terms of how that crop performs. We've, we've implemented this system on this farm for five years now and the average yields have gone up and up and up every year despite having more climatic challenges. And for me, it's about that, that having that uplift in biodiversity across the whole farm. It's having a definite impact on how well those crops grow and how susceptible they are to, to challenges. I put the picture in on the right just because it's the best, best picture I've taken this year by far. That's a 15 species summer cover crop. Again, we're being paid now to do that in England. So it's called a legume fallow. So you basically take the field out of production for a year and you drill something like this. Now, I appreciate that's not food production, that's not farming, it's not what we're doing, but having something like that in rotation allows your cash crops to thrive so much better. Imagine drilling wheat into a field like that rather than something that's been you know, heavily farmed, heavily cultivated for the last five, six years and had no rest at all. So, we're, And we're being paid to do it. So we're improving the fertility, we're improving the performance of our cash crops and we're being supported to do that. Now I appreciate you don't have those systems in place yet, if there's any, is there any government ministers in the building? Do we have any? Good, okay, in some ways good, but yeah. I, I would talk to them and pressure them into this because you know, if you guys are gonna meet these climate targets, these CO2 emissions targets, you're gonna stay in business, you're gonna keep producing food, and you're gonna tick all of these boxes that people are asking you to tick. You need to be supported to do it, and this is a, a really important way of doing so. How am I doing for time? Good, yeah. Um, in terms of managing crops, this is what I'm aiming for. Now, I don't expect you to read all of this or understand it in the two seconds I'm going to give you to do so, but this is a principle that was outlined by John Kemp from the US, and he basically thinks that all plants can be completely immune to pests and diseases if you put these principles in place. Now, I'm not sure if I believe him completely, but I do believe in partially because I've seen it working in the field. So what this basically says is if you get soil health and soil biology working effectively and you then manage the crop well in terms of nutrition, then you'll have a plant that's uh, immune to pest and disease attack. Whether we can get all the way to the top and be completely resistant to all that stuff, 
I'm yet to get there, but I hope we can. But this is really what I base my crop management on now. So good soils, good soil biology, and good nutritional management, and all the principles we've talked about, particularly diversity. Uh, and to do that, again, it comes back to understanding and baselines. Again, lots of detail here. I don't expect you to understand it all in two seconds. But these are the levels of soil tests that we're now doing to be able to understand what my soil is capable of, what am I growing, what does my eight, nine, ten tonne a hectare wheat crop need to be uh, productive and give me the best yield for the least amount of inputs. To really do that, you have to understand what your soil is capable of doing, and this puts it in numbers, okay? So we're looking at the soil texture, exchange capacity, we're measuring organic matter in terms of total organic matter, carbon, active carbon, two types of pH, and then we're splitting out uh, nutrients in terms of what's the total amount of nutrients in the soil, but what's actually crop available, what can my crop take up in season and, and contribute to that final yield. And doing that not only allows you to increase production, but it allows you to increase production in the most efficient way possible. So you're not guessing about how much fertiliser to put on, you're putting exactly on what that crop needs uh, to give you the best result possible. And we're now bolting on sap analysis. Does anyone here use Nova Crop in the Netherlands for sap analysis yet? One person, top man, gold star. Um, yeah, this, this has been, for me, in the, in the time that I've done this job, probably the biggest game changer in terms of crop management. So what this is telling me is it's a, it's a live, in-season measurement of A, how healthy my crop is, and B, how well it's balanced nutritionally, and takes all of the guesswork out of, of crop nutrition, allows me to make fine-tuned details and applications in-season, um, but also tells me whether I've got my strategy right from a soils perspective for that year. So when it comes to implementing new systems, and particularly one in it within an, a reduced input environment, this is a really key tool. So I would encourage you all to have a play around with, with SAP analysis. And the fact that you're in the EU means that it should be a lot easier to get, in Europe, sorry, to get samples across to the Netherlands, because it's been an absolute nightmare from the UK to get samples across. Sometimes they turn up, sometimes they don't, sometimes they turn up in three weeks' time. Um, basically because nobody likes us anymore. So, um, but it should be a lot easier for you guys to get samples across there. So I would recommend that you have a go with this because it's, it's really, really important. I've been asked to touch briefly on the numbers. So I'm going to talk numbers. Um, I'm not going to look at, this isn't a specific farm, but every year I collect financial data and performance data from all of the farms I work with. So what this is is a, is a reflection, okay, of, of, of those farms. So I've laid out here the kind of gross margin analysis of, a, let's say, a conventional winter wheat crop in the UK. Our average yields are eight and a half tonnes a hectare. This is a rough price that we've been achieving for a tonne of wheat. Um, and those are the seed, fur, and spray costs. Uh, then we have operations, so cultivating, drills, etc., uh, which then gives us our gross margin and our net margin. So there's your conventional winter wheat crop. What I thought I'd do is then just provide an example of how those numbers look based on whether you get it wrong or whether you get it right by implementing Regen Ag. So this is if you just implement one thing, which is no-till, and your soils aren't ready to implement no-till. So you've instantly wiped off one tonne a hectare of yield, and, and I see that all the time. And so, In fact, sometimes it's more than that. So you've lost a tonne a hectare of yield, you heard somebody talk once about no-till farming and you need to put more seed on, so you've actually increased your seed costs because you put more seed on. And all of that means that your, actually, your costs are actually higher, your yields are lower. Uh, you have saved the cultivation pass because you're now going no-till, but if you look at your gross margin and net margin, you're worse off. So you've actually lost money despite thinking that you've made a saving. Another thing I've seen people do is compound that issue. So they'll go, right, I'm now a no-till farmer and I've heard that nitrogen is really bad for my carbon footprint and because it's bad for soil, it's just bad in general, so I'm going to put less on. So you've done no-till uh, and you've done a, a, a significant reduction in your nitrogen inputs, okay? So you've lost another half a tonne a hectare of yield. Your FERC costs have gone down a little bit. Your seed costs are still up. 
your operations are the same, your margin is now even lower, both in terms of gross margin and net margin after operations. So hopefully that illustrates, and this is based on real numbers, these are from farms who have done that over the last three to five years. It makes a big difference getting this right or wrong. So make sure you go back to all of those things I said, understand what your system's capable of and implement no-till, reduced end, at a, at a sensible pace and when you're able to properly without affecting these numbers. And on the flip side, I've taken some figures from some of my regenerative farms who've been doing it the longest. They've implemented this process properly. They're making it work. Um, and the, this is how it looks. I've actually also, just to be fair, knocked off half a tonne a hectare of yield, which in reality doesn't happen. We're able to maintain yields, but let's just say we've knocked off half a tonne. Our seed costs are the same because we're, we're no tilling, so you've got that slight increase. Our fertilizer is significantly down. Our spray spend is down. Our operations are down. And our gross margin is up. So is our net margin. And the only difference here is that we've made the same changes, but we've made them in a system that's built for success. Okay? One thing I thought I'd finally add on, because it's partially a plug for the new business I'm going to work to, but just gives you an example of what happens when the marketplace recognizes some of these practices. So Wild Farmed, ask their farmers to do all of these things and farm regeneratively. And to, as a reward for doing so, they're paying them a significant premium for their wheat. We accept that because they're doing these things and we've restricted them, so we say we, you can't put any pesticides on, you can only use a certain amount of nitrogen, we're accepting that we're gonna have a lower yield. So our, our winter wheat yield is now six ton, but our price is 280. <clears throat> We've got significant savings um, in fur and sprays. The seed costs are actually higher because we're using high seed rates and we're putting companion species with the wheat. Um, and all of that is resulting in still a higher gross margin and a higher net margin than our conventional or even the standard regen. So it just gives you an idea of what can happen when you put all of these practices in place and also the market then rewards you for doing so. And you may even in future be able to bolt on payments associated with reduced carbon emissions as well. So I think personally the future is bright. If all this system does is makes your farm more resilient and stand up to the pressures better, then that's great. But if it can do these things as well and actually make a, a fundamental difference to your bottom line as farmers and as businessmen, then, and women, of course, then it's got to be the right way to go. I think that's it for me. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I always talk about that fifth principle of livestock integration as the one that's negotiable, okay? So I think that all of the things that I've talked about today are achievable without livestock. But if you have the option to, in, to implement livestock, then those positives will happen quicker, and I think they'll happen to a greater extent. So having no livestock or the ability to Im implement livestock in a system is not the end of the world. <clears throat> and it's not a barrier to region ag at all, um, but if you can, it definitely helps. Okay. But you definitely need some sheep in Estonia. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I myself uh, had one question. Uh, I'll, I'll talk into the microphone so the translators would hear as well. So. Um, have you seen any financial risks associated with region farming uh, for the farmer in the short term, and how can they uh, mitigate those risks? Um, I think the biggest risk is generally around the perception that to change the system you need to change all of your equipment, and therefore there's a high capital cost. So it's a bit of a myth 
that you have to go out and buy new cultivators, new drills, new equipment to do all of this stuff. In many instances, actually, it's just a case of maybe taking existing machinery and just changing it slightly or using it in a different way, using it shallower, changing the points, whatever, um, which means that you can actually get through that first few years of transition without having to take big risks financially by investing in, in, in new machinery um, and still achieve the same thing. So that for me has been the biggest risk because I've seen, I've seen lots of businesses um, have this kind of light bulb moment and decide that they want to be regenerative farmers. They're, they're sold on the idea, they go out and invest in lots of machinery and then they realize that actually it's, a, it's, it's quite difficult, but they've spent all that money. And because maybe the, the finances on the farm are already tight, they don't have a huge amount of, of, of slack in the system um, to be able to take risks like that. So that's generally the biggest risk that I see and that's, that's the way, way to mitigate it.